Jan, you were referring to the crystal ball. Mm -hmm. Can I ask, do you think the Springboks will win the World Cup? I didn't get the question. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, when the, uh, the coalition uh, parties come in next year, um, how long do you think it would take for a better restor restoration of power if some of the elements of ESCOM are privatized? That's a good question. Um, one needs to sit back and look at ESCOM as it is now. Will ESCOM be, and let's just talk again about the generation component, will the ESCOM generation in future be the same as it used to be in the past? The only generator of electrons to satisfy the needs uh, and the demand? No, it will not. The ESCOM of the future generation, in my view, will be one of the companies supplying electricity, generating electricity to the country. This is why the person, or this unit with a crystal ball, which is transmission, needs to get in place as soon as possible. I was very uh, thrilled, you know, last week to, to find out that NASA has now um, approved the, the operating license. What is outstanding now is a trading license and then the import-export license. So... I cannot answer you how, how long it will take should there be a coalition um, uh, in place. Uh, but I believe that we need to understand and continue on this, this path that we need to have a unit that will look at this demand as well as uh, the, the, the capacity and the trading thereof. And then to understand these independent power producer companies that needs to come to line to assist in terms of the demand. So from a political point of view, I, it's difficult for me to answer, but I believe that we know exactly what we need to do. We just need to work together and get together as a team and do exactly that. And I believe that the private sector will play a very important role in future to assist, you know, to have sustainable and reliable power. But just to, just to follow up on that, Kendall has been a big success since it was privatized. They're generating a lot of electricity for Johannesburg, or so the GM tells me. Uh, is that a possibility that some of those power stations will be privatized like the old mines were? Remember, Perulis used to take the old Anglo mines and make a lot of money out of them where Anglo couldn't make money out of them. Yeah. Look, uh, quite a few of these old power stations will come to end of life, and I believe that's an ideal opportunity to put that into the market and to ask, you know, independent power producers, you know, to bid on those and, and to generate. Because what is nice, you have a, a infrastructure already, you have a, um, a, a substation next to the power station, you connect it already to the grid. That grid is connected to all the load centers. So I believe it's an ideal opportunity. Absolutely. I think Jordan's, uh, um, Hill Lewis is trying to do something with that, that power station on the way to the airport. Yeah. Because it's got everything in Athlone, yeah. Athlone, okay. Jan, I want to Yesterday, we were, I was at a, con a, a seminar that presented a financial graph highlighting the electricity, excess electricity compared to GDP growth. So excess electricity availability percentage or compared to the GDP growth and how successful com uh, countries had leveraged the excess electricity. Um, they also forecast independent power producers moving to, to exceeding Eskom's capacity generation by in the next two to three years. The question I wanted to ask, though, was does our transmission network have sufficient capacity to cater to that? And then also off the back of that, oh, well, to use your analogy, so does it, are we going to add new cars and not have a freeway to, to run on? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks. No, we don't have enough highways. Absolutely. We did, when I was in Eskom, uh, we did an, a sort of a, a look ahead over the next 15 years on about 20 gigawatts of the 42 gigawatts, that's base load capacity, will come to end of life. So you need then, if you talk about a hybrid solution, you need to connect 50,000 megawatts if you take 20,000 off. Um, and the figure we had at the time was about a trillion rand that we need to spend. 
putting 50 gigawatts uh, on the grid. But then also, very importantly, we had to build, we have to build 14,000 kilometers of transmission lines. So the roads that you're talking about, because where, where does wind blow and where does the sun shine? In areas currently where there's no infrastructure, where there's no grid. So that needs to happen. And then together with that, you also need to build, obviously, you know, some big substations, about 12 of those, because where you take the power, where you've got to get the losses back, etc. But then in addition to that, another 7,500 kilometers of distribution line needs to be built as well. So the point that you're making is critical. One must not only talk about additional capacity, thinking it's generation only, because those electrons need to get somewhere to the load centers. So your point is that. But now I understand that in that joints, I have now put another work stream together, work stream 10 or something, that is looking exactly at this component. So also part of your crystal ball. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, hi, Jan, thank you. Uh, you made it clear we need a hybrid solution. Uh, and in Andre's book, Truth to Power, he said he was pro-renewable and not for nuclear you rightfully pointed out, though, that renewables uh, produce when nature is favorable and not necessarily when we need it. That's something that, from my perspective, the oil and gas and coal money love to hinge on. Uh, but what I'm not hearing about is storage. I mean, we've spoken about transmission and everything. I'm not hearing storage. From my perspective, pump storage is easy to build, especially in mountainous areas like Cape Town. We already have the reservoirs. The machinery is easy to maintain. Um, do you agree that ESCOM should focus on storage rather than fixing its existing infrastructure and let the private sector solve generation? Thank you. Storage is critical, make no mistake. Either batteries or pump storage. Um, ESCOM in addition, or let me re rephrase, the system operator of ESCOM in addition needs pump storage to ensure regulating and instantaneous reserves. So when you do have a problem on the network, you know, to release water, you have immediate, you know, uh, power available to, to support the integrity of your grid. So I agree with you. We need additional pump storage, but we also need batteries. When the wind blows and, you, and during the day or the sunshine during the day, and you don't need those electrons at the point, that you can actually store it. So I agree with you. Your your comment on let um, the private sector, you know, fix ESCOM, uh, I, I have my own views about that. Um, as I said earlier, where we shut down power stations because of age, and again, I'm not saying shut down power stations without looking if you can extend life. I'm not saying that. Wherever you can do it, and economically it might sense, and especially where the country finds itself now, you must look, and if it's necessary, you do invest in that. Uh, I would rather see the private sector then taking over, you know, these assets and generate electricity in whatever form. But ESCOM needs to continue not only getting pump stores, they need to fix what they have. Because... I also believe if you take Eskom, if Eskom was my business and, and generation, let's just talk generation, I will sit back and say, which five or six power stations will I invest now in and to make sure that in time to come you have a good energy availability, it's reliable and it's predictable because there's a time going to come in this country as well that trading is going to become important that the generators will bit into a system on what will they have available and at what price. And if you have a system that's unreliable and you bit in, you, you've been awarded that, 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 that period and you cannot produce, you're going to pay heavy penalties. So I believe that Eskom needs to continue to invest in getting the, the, the cold fire fleet to perform as good as possible and have a very positive and, and acceptable energy availability factor. Um, uh, Jan, sorry, so what would your thoughts be just on the price of electricity in the next few years to us as consumers? And second question, maybe just you've looked at the electricity car that wasn't being serviced as well as it should have serviced. Um, are there any other infrastructure that you think that maybe we can't see so well that's in serious need of servicing? I just came back from 
um, an area that they didn't have water, have water for two weeks. And, um, yeah, we can't see it so well. So, you know, the problem can just someday be there. I'm concerned about Eskom's transmission infrastructure. Um, when I rejoined Eskom five years ago, the transmission performance was in a nosedive. Um, and what to understand, if you have load shedding the way it is now, you have load shedding for two hours, which is painful, or four hours, whatever the case may be, but at least there's still power. If you lose a big transmission line, you've got millions of people without power for days, maybe weeks. So the investment in refurbishing, strengthening, and replacing specifically the old protection systems on the transmission system didn't receive the attention because of finance. And that was a huge concern to me. We have given it a lot of attention in my time, and the performance has improved. But you only have so much money available to do what you need to do. So that still remains a concern to me, although it is, I can give you the guarantee, a lot of attention. I just trust that we will be, Eskom will be in a position that they will be over that hump before it is not too late by replacing and to do the strengthening and the refurbishing. So that for me is a concern. On the distribution side, there's also the concern uh, because the, the assets are old. If you take the, uh, the transmission assets, on average, it's more than 40 years old. And again, if you maintain it well, you know, it's not an issue. But it's when you haven't maintained and haven't invested what you were supposed to that you may pick up some, some challenge. So th that still remains a challenge with myself and my head but Eskom is giving the necessary attention, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, what was your first question, sorry? The price. The price. I thought you are not going to ask that. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, there was a time that uh, Eskom had the lowest electricity uh, in the world. But unfortunately, uh, time has moved on for various reasons uh, that we're not there. Being... Let's go back a, another year or so when I was in Eskom and part of the leadership. We in Eskom believe at the time that our tariff is not cost reflective for whatever it is. You know, what it's costing us to generate and to transmit and to distribute uh, is not cost reflective. Uh, and this came over many, many years that what Eskom has requested was not granted. And that gap has just gone quite, quite wide. But Eskom is also very sensitive for what an increase of tariff is doing to the economy of the country, and that is all of us. So Eskom will continue to ask for some tariff increases in my mind, uh, the way I see it, uh, but they will also be responsible in what they're asking for. So I, I still believe that Eskom in order to, to become more cost-reflective, we'll ask for tariff increases. What, it, what the magnitude is going to be, unfortunately, I don't know anymore. Yeah, it's a scary story. I mean, as taxpayers, we put $500 billion sure. into Eskom, and a lot of it was stolen, but exactly. that's not exactly. for this subject. Hi, Jan. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the, in my view, there's probably three areas that we look at in, in terms of the operation of Eskom. It's probably the strategy, so like what are we doing and what do we need to do? Um, the capacity, are we, do we have the people, the resources, the budgets, I guess, to do it? And then the last part is, do we have the capability or the willingness almost to fix those issues? So the question is, in your view, which one of those three areas are is ESCOM failing in predominantly, and then who's accountable for it? Why Why is that person not being held accountable? And I'm saying the person, not department. Uh, in my view, there are five issues, five big issues. Um, I was asked the same question in um, on Tuesday. Yeah, it was on Tuesday at the 
Free State Agricultural Congress in, 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 in Bloemfontein. But I believe there are five big issues in my view. What happened between the time that we were number one in the world to where we are now? I believe there are five issues. The one being, in my view, the most important one, human capital. You can have, what people also don't understand is, if you don't show respect to a piece of mechanical equipment, isn't it amazing what respect you're going to get back? And who is actually looking after managing that? It's human people. And, 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 and I believe that we don't fully appreciate and understand the value of the most important asset of the organization, the people. And so I believe that is a challenge. Earlier, right in the beginning, I said, how do you get 20 years of experience? A piece of paper doesn't mean a qualification. You can do the job. It takes time. And you need somebody that can take you by the hand and help you. And I don't believe there's enough value on exactly this mentorship issue. So the people is a big issue. Finance is another significant issue. If money was not available to invest, and it's still a very challenging situation. If you have a business and you've got 400 billion of debt, you know, it is, it is real, it's a real challenge. How do, you, how do you then take what you have available and give it? I believe Eskom is very grateful that the Minister of Finance has given some relief last year. And then the third issue, and I'm just giving the high level points, under each and every point, there's, there's quite a lot that you need to do. Then it is a maintenance. You, we, as Eskom, or the country needs to make sure that we continue to maintain the assets that we have. And this is not only generation, it's also the wire side of the business. Then the fourth one, you can have all the skilled people, you can have all the money in the world, you can be ready to do all the maintenance on your assets. But if you don't need to have additional capacity, to fix what you have, exactly. So that is the fourth one, is the additional capacity. And then the fifth one that we haven't spoken about today that much, I think, is corruption and criminality. That is another significant. So those are the five issues, in my view, that needs to take the, uh, the center stage in terms of focus. But my point is, the first one, the human capital, is where we need to invest. Now, Eskom, they have... All the talent in the world. You know, the good Lord has, has, has blessed Eskom with people, you know, with, you know, the potential, talent, etc. But you've got to harvest that now. You've got to, you've got to develop that. And I think that's what needs to happen. Now you ask me the question, who do you hold accountable? A lot of people. I believe it's a, it's a bit more complex. Um, who owns this business? I believe no, no, we're talking about who owns Eskom. No, no, we're talking about who owns Eskom. Okay. If you answer that, if it's it's actually a very simple answer, but and if you know that, then you know the challenges of that reason. Because Eskom also needs to to implement the objectives of the owner. And it makes it very challenging. You know, a guy like Andre. Now, Andre and myself work close very well, you know, uh, together. And, and I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, I haven't read the book. Because people ask me, why haven't you read the book? I said, why do I need to read the book if I was part of it? You know, so... <laughs> no, I mean part of the, 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 the period that he was there. But, and this is why I believe somebody said it's in the book that when he arrived that first day, I invited him into my office. Uh, no, he actually walked in. I invited him to sit and I made him some coffee. I've got a coffee machine there of old Brian Down as a previous CEO. And uh, I said, you know what, let's clear something. I didn't apply for your job. I don't want your job. Because in my view, it's a political job. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to, to talk with you again. Jan, thank you. For coming here. Before we go, before we go. (laughs) 
just to support your view about the people at Eskom, living here in Hermanus, we had some incredible winds uh, a, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, which knocked over, blew over two pylons. And they put the electricity back on against incredible odds in a very short period of time. So meeting you, listening to you, getting an insight from you, I hope will we'll let people know here that it w that it wasn't a fluke, that wasn't just a one-off, that there are lots and lots of really good people oh, yeah. who are going out there. And I hope Ian Cameron, when he talks about crime and corruption later, is going to remi remember that 90% of the people in the organization are there to serve as they are in the police force. It's just those damn 10% who make it so difficult for everyone else. And we, we uh, look forward to your contribution to our country from outside the tent into the future. Thank you.